Welcome to the Model Health Show. This is fitness and nutrition expert Sean Stevenson here with my amazing co-host and producer of the Model Health Show, Jade Harrell. What's up, Jade? What's up, Sean? <laughs> How you doing today? Today I am incredulous. Incredulous. Yes. All right, tell me about it. Gloriously incredible today. Oh, I like it? that. You threw the glory in there. I did. That's what it's all about. It's, the, it's about that glory. <laughs> <laughs> Rain down on me. That's right. Everybody, thank you so much for tuning into the show today. Mm -hmm. We've got an important and powerful episode lined up for you Game on this changer. day. Yes. And so today's show is very important because this is something that is a part of our culture. It's something deeply, deeply ingrained into the world as you know it in ways that you have probably never paid attention to before that we're going to bring to the light. And that is our societies, our world's connection and obsession with sugar. And so today's episode, I'm going to take you through a history of sugar and where this whole thing started yeah. and all of the things connecting sugar to, into our lives today. Today, we're going to be talking about sex, drugs, and entertainment. Oh, sugar. This wild history of sugar. <laughs> <laughs> and you're going to learn some things that are definitely going to change yeah. the course of your life and, and your perspective about sugar and about even our food system today. Okay. Okay. So before we do that, I want to give a shout out to our show sponsor, onit.com. Today I had their emulsified MCT oil, which I have most days. Mm -hmm. And so this is, well, first of all, what is MCT oil? Right. So we're talking about medium chain triglycerides. Mm -hmm. And this is generally food. going to be uh, something that is derived from coconut oil and or palm oil. And so these medium chain triglycerides are very important fuel for the human body. They are digested very differently than the long and short chain fats. Mm -hmm. And this is a very bioavailable almost instant energy source in many ways because it bypasses the normal digestive process and it's in a the certain size that it can actually traverse through your cell membranes and get right to your 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 cells to give you energy mm -hmm. which is just fascinating in of itself but also a little fun fact is that it has a thermogenic effect that means essentially boosting your body's metabolism mm -hmm. right that that inner fire yeah, no, that fire. that boiling inside <laughs> and positively affects your metabolism. Mm -hmm. Also, MCTs are supportive of your gut environment. All right? It's very gut-friendly and, and important. And this is something we talk about a lot on the show, this vastly amazing and brilliant microbiome, this built-in tropical rainforest we're all uh, living with inside of our own bellies. And so uh, supporting that, that microbiome is of the utmost importance. And uh, it's anti-parasitic, antibacterial, antifungal, has some really wonderful properties at protecting the good guys mm -hmm. in your microbiome. So this is why I love the MCT oil so much and why I love it from on it is they have the emulsified mm -hmm. MCT oils that are basically like creamers, right, that you can add to your uh, elixirs, your, your teas, your coffees, whatever you're into. My wife loves the vanilla flavor. She adds that to her mushroom coffee. Mm -hmm. uh, she does that on a daily basis. And I love the strawberry flavor. Big, big fan of that that I Me like to too. mix into like lion's mane tea and cordyceps mm -hmm. tea. We mix it into uh, the breakfast muffins and it's like a butter. Come on. Now. It makes it more. It makes strawberry muffins and they taste buttery. It's wonderful. That reminds me of that strawberry quick. <laughs> yeah. Right. This is so far <laughs> different than that. Yes. But I, I was killing yeah. the strawberry quick. And for people who don't know what that is, it was like some random care. You know, all the stuff that's bad for you as a yeah. kid. It's as like a they got a cartoon. Mascot. Right. Yeah. That bunny was so <laughs> like, yeah. It's gonna give you diabetes. <laughs> Don't worry about it. And so, but uh, this it was basically like a chocolate, you know, like a chocolate powder, mm -hmm. but it was tilted towards this kind of strawberry flavor. I was so into that. Oh, yeah. So now we can upgrade that in a big, big way by utilizing these MCT oils. So mm -hmm. make sure to head over there and check them out. It's onit.com forward slash model. That's O N N I T dot com forward slash M O D E L. You're gonna get 10% off all of your health and human performance supplements. They've also got the Hemp Force Protein, the Shroom Tech Immune, Shroom Tech Sport, which is an amazing pre-workout. So somebody actually just came over to me at the gym recently who I didn't really know that they listened to the show and they came up to me and they're like, hey, I just got on that, sh that Shroom Tech. Oh, yeah. And it's like I feel really amazing. Mm -hmm. Like I've never mm -hmm. had anything like it. I've done some pre-workout things that will make me feel kind of weird and make me feel weir weird afterwards. But there's just like this kind of natural energy left and it's just sustainable. It feels good and I don't feel like 
it goes away and I notice it later. Absolutely. You know, and so I was like, that's a, such a great story. So um, definitely head over there, check them out. On it.com forward slash model for 10% off. Now let's get to the iTunes review of the week. This is another great one. The title is Feeling Fantastic Nude. <laughs> Fantastic Nude. Thanks so much for this incredible and entertaining podcast. I listen to each show and sometimes go back and re listen to make show notes. I'm absorbing all the info provided by Sean, Jade, and the amazing guests. And as a former college athlete, I thought I had my body and weight training figured out. I was sadly mistaken. The Model Health Show has, has helped me sustain a great lifestyle in food and positive mentality towards all aspects of life. I can't recommend this show enough. It isn't a short-term investment, though. Make sure you put in the work, and in the long term, you will feel great. That's from Johnny Boy, 536. Fantastic. Thank you so much for leaving that review. That means a lot. Fantastic nude. Fantastic nude. I was like, it's fantastically nude? Yeah. So with the renewed. So I love that. Thank you so much for sharing that. And that's just brilliant. I appreciate you so much. Everybody, thank you for leaving their reviews on iTunes. Please keep them coming if you've yet to leave a review. Pop over there to iTunes, leave us a review. And we truly, truly do appreciate that. And on that note, let's get to our topic of the day. Going so today. On a trip. We're talking about the history of sugar, mm -hmm. sex, drugs, and entertainment. Right. And we're going to talk about how this has become a really uh, powerful cultural phenomenon. It's something that's deeply ingrained in so many different areas of our lives that heretofore we might not have recognized. And so to really take that and bring it to the surface. So I'm going to take you on a journey with me today. And we're going to start, we're going to go through a timeline and look at the beginnings of this substance and the many different aspects that it's been able to influence along its journey to where we are today. And where we are today is probably going to knock you out of your chair as well. And so we're, we're hoping to create a new future and a new relationship with this sweet, sweet substance. And so we're going to start with uh, uh, just a really important caveat here, which is there are many forms of sugar. But today, for our focus, we're mainly going to look deeply into the history of what we refer to as table sugar and the sugar products that we use to, to sweeten our food and drink. And this episode is going to be valuable because it looks at the parallels that we see with sugar and worldwide, the worldwide obesity epidemic, which is one of the things that is kind of common knowledge now, but we're really going to drill down into that. And also, I think you'll be shocked to find the connection between sugar and chronic illnesses, violence, and the connection between things like ethnic diversity, all right? So today you're going to understand at a deep fundamental level how much sugar has impacted society as we know it. And let's start at the start. Okay. All right, where, <laughs> where, where did this whole thing begin? And really, if we look at human physiology, we evolved on a diet that actually contained very little sugar. And there was virtually no refined carbohydrates at all throughout. We're talking about hundreds of years of our evolution. And in fact, many experts feel that sugar probably entered our diets by accident. <laughs> and yet humans, this is important to understand, yet we have sought out sweet things since our earliest days of evolution. And there's an evolutionary biologist at Harvard University. His name is Daniel Lieberman. And he says that, quote, sugar is a deep, deep ancient craving, end quote. And it's because sugar signals something to our entire biology. And sweet signals something that is pretty important in us in our survival, which is it's a signal for a dense source of calories. Right? It's a signal to our biology that there's a dense source of calories, i.e. energy. All right. Plus, sugar offers far more than just energy. It also helps us to store fat, too. And if you look at, again, our, our survival, fat is pretty important because when you eat sugar, your body breaks it down into glucose and fructose. And fructose specifically appears to activate a process in your body that makes you want to hold on to more fat. And we're going to talk about that more today. And there was a time that hanging on to more body fat was actually considered an advantage and not a health risk. And it was thanks to a mutation that upregulated sugar being stored as fat to help to ensure the survival of our species. And this was a time when food was scarce and meals were inconsistent. It's a lot different when we're talking about hunting versus walking over to your refrigerator. You have a harder time not finding food now. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> I'm trying to be away from food. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> hunting is way, okay. 
way more energy intensive than pulling up to the drive through <laughs> you know? So we have to understand that, that hanging on to fat was more of an advantage. So sweet things in nature, like certain ripe fruits and honey to our ancestors were a jackpot. Now, though we've long had a desire for sweet things, we simply didn't have regular access to them, but that would eventually change. And when we shift gears to the origin of sugar as we know it today, it's mainly extracted from sugar cane and the roots of sugar beets. And originally, people chewed raw sugar cane to extract its sweetness. And sugar cane was then, you know, we're talking about thousands of years ago, this was a native of tropical South Asia and Southeast Asia. And different species seem to have originated from different locations in India and Africa as well. And this just brings to mind a story. Uh, my wife, she told me that she used to chew on sugar canes. Mm-hmm. My wife's from Kenya uh, when she was a kid. And I'm just like, really? You chewed on something that had sugar in it? And it's just a t- this was early on when we first met. And it's just I didn't understand because I'm just like, isn't that bad for your teeth? And it was actually well noted to be great for your teeth. And this was partially, ironically, it's great for your teeth because mm-hmm. of the chewing work involved. Like, bones your teeth are the only bones you can see which is kind of weird yeah and just like your bones they actually get stronger and more dense through exercise so that's part of it but also uh we're looking at it contained a a pretty rich amount of uh, vitamins and minerals as well vitamin a c b1 b2 b3 b5 b6 (laughs) almost the whole b complex Mm -hmm. along with b street (laughs) <laughs> <Beast Street. laughs> along with a nice concentration of phytonutrients, antioxidants, and soluble fiber, also calcium, chromium, cobalt, magnesium, copper, potassium, and zinc. Get so out. there's a it lot a of superfood. In a way, in a way, <laughs> we can look at it like that, you know. And so this was something again that was noted to be kind of good for your teeth, and this was something that people have been kind of chewing on for a long, long time. Now, the first chemically refined sugar appeared on the scene in India about 2,500 years ago. And there the Indians discovered a method of turning sugarcane juice into granulated crystals that were easier to store and transport. And in the local Indian language, these crystals were known as kanda, kandaha. And this was a source of the word candy that we now have today. And this special sugar was found in Europe by the first century AD, but primarily as an imported medicine, okay, and not as a food. And so this is like, how sugar medicine? Well, this was actually combined with not the best tasting medicines, herbs, things like that. And it kind of, it's that whole understanding, uh, it's the, the Mary Poppins line, mm-hmm. right? Spoon Just a spoonful of sugar, full of sugar helps, helps the, the medicine, medicine go, go down. down. And shout out to Mary In Poppins. In the most delightful way. I didn't know I'd get that. <laughs> I, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. <laughs> And so basically it makes these uh, other medicines more palatable. And so it was used as that originally. Now, crusaders also brought home sugar with them to Europe after their campaigns in the Holy Land. And there they encountered caravans carrying what they refer to uh, many times as sweet salt, right? Sweet salt. Because, of course, they look look pretty similar. Mm -hmm. Now, sugar was considered a luxury in Europe until about the 18th century when it became more widely available. And in fact, in 1319, a kilo of sugar, also called, another name was white gold, went for two shillings a pound in London. And that's the equivalent of about $50 a pound in current dollars. And this is what kept it a luxury item. And most people went their entire lives, unless they were in the richest classes, their entire lives without having this sugar. But by the 19th century, sugar became extremely popular and even considered a necessity. And this evolution in taste and demand for sugar as an essential food product unleashed a major, major economic and social change. And sugar was considered to be one of the major drivers of colonization of tropical islands and nations where labor-intensive sugarcane plantations and sugar manufacturing could thrive. Uh, the, the demand for cheap labor to perform the hard work involved in cultivating and processing increased the demand for the slave trade from Africa, and in particular from West Africa. And slavery is often tied in our minds, and I even asked my son about this, like, what do you think about, what are the crops involved? And he, he said cotton. And also, I would say tobacco, tobacco would come to mind. But sugar production was a huge driver of slavery as well. And in the 16th century, Native people 
were enslaved by Europeans throughout the Caribbean islands, particularly Barbados and Jamaica, and in Central and South America as well as labor to harvest sugarcane. And with the native peoples being depleted by disease and harsh working conditions, African slaves were then brought in to take their place in the fields and processing operations. Now, hundreds of thousands of slaves died due to the conditions of the sugarcane fields. And a lot of people just don't know about this. And I know that I didn't when I began my research. I was really shocked by this. But there was an extreme culture because of this, you know, in passing away, there was an extreme culture of mental and physical violence, brutal labor, lack of medical care, and a prevalence of infectious disease and malnutrition as well. And by 1807, and this is the time when Britain banned slave trading in, in this year, uh, at least 6 million African slaves have been incarcerated on sugarcane plantations. Now, this is one of the roots of how it's so widespread in our kind of westernized world today. And it has this dark, dark, really horrific beginning. And I think it's important for us to note that. Absolutely. But moving forward, so what we're looking at here in a summation is that millions of slaves and as well as indentured laborers were brought into the Americas and the Caribbean and as well as the Indian Ocean colonies, Southeast Asia, Pacific Islands, and also East Africa as well. And the modern ethnic mix of many nations that have settled in the past couple of centuries have been influenced by the demand for sugar. So it's, in essence, it's this melting pot that has some sugar sprinkled in <laughs> that has helped to create this diversity, this ethnic mix of, and if you, you see this, you know, like I see uh, friends from Barbados, from Jamaica, mm -hmm. who look so different than you'd expect. Absolutely. And it's due to, you know, the complexion of their skin, their, their appearance of their hair, mm -hmm. those kind of things are such a diverse mixture of people. And sugar was actually okay. behind a lot of it. So I wanted to just highlight this brief snapshot at this timeline and talk about the beginnings of like, why are we even driven so much to strive to get something sweet? And also what it can do as far as manipulating our culture and how far that this desire went in the enslavement of people mm -hmm. and for this cultivation and where we are now. So we're getting closer to that. But I want to talk about this rise in consumption. And but really quick, let me give you a really brief understanding of how sugar is made. Now, sugar cane is grown and harvested, obviously. So I'm just going to give you a quick rundown. All right. Then it's washed. Got to wash. Got to wash it. Uh, right. As my uh, third grade <laughs> Uh, teacher would say, wash. Got to wash, gotta wash it. it. Wash it. So you got to harvest, grow it. Mm -hmm. Then we wash it. Then it's crushed. And the cane juice is, is extracted from the fiber. And the cane juice is then put through a clarification process to remove the impurities. Mm -hmm. And from there, it's there's an evaporation process to remove the water. Now, the remaining syrup then goes through a crystallization process. Now, this is where it's evaporated until it's saturated with sugar. Then, and this is the interesting part, small grains called seeds, and these are just basically some grains of sugar are added, which then creates this growth of, it's kind of like the nuclei for the formation of sugar crystals. So they take this syrup, this kind of uh, saturated sugar, and add these grains to it, and then it becomes granulated. Oh, wow. Very interesting, these sugar crystals. Then it's put through a, a centrifuge, dried, ran through multiple screenings um, to extract the uniform sugar that we generally see and remove remaining byproducts. Mm -hmm. So that's just a brief breakdown of how the sugar is made. You know, I could go in and we could break down for 20 minutes each section of that, mm -hmm. but you get the picture. You know it ends up looking like cocaine <laughs> at the end of it. So let's jump back to the 1700s. This rise of consumption uh, was was starting to set the pace around this time because at this point, an average person in Britain consumed about four pounds of sugar a year. And that amount will gradually increase as the price of sugar falls due to the overproduction in the Americas. Mm -hmm. Now, making and this makes it affordable for the middle class and the poor. And by 1870, the average resident of Britain now consumes 47 pounds of sugar a year. Wow. So we went from four to 47. Wow. All right. And until around this time, sugar was pro 
produced in what were called loaves, which had to be cut using tools called sugar nips. Mm-hmm. All right, and that's kind of like something that maybe is a pet name you give to your significant <laughs> other. I don't know, sugar <laughs> nips, but I thought that was interesting. And in later years, the granulated sugar was usually sold in bags. And sugar cubes were also produced by the 19th century. And in May of 1896, American Sugar became one of the original 12 companies in the Dow Jones Industrial Average. All one right, so we're talking about 12 yes. that created the security, financial security yeah. system in this country. Wow. Yes, it is absolutely crazy. You know, it's something, again, that I had no idea. You know, you don't really think about the S&P, you know, the Dow Jones, and being something related to sugar, but that was one of the original 12 Mm -hmm. companies there. Commodity. It was was such Mm -hmm. an important part of our economics. Now, by 1900, sugar consumption in Britain more than doubles, and the average person now is eating about 100 pounds of sugar annually. And the average American was consuming about 40 pounds of sugar annually. Today, today the average U.S. citizen eats about 150 pounds of added sugars each year. And this is including one of the industry favorites, which is high fructose corn syrup, Mm -hmm. skyrocketing up from about 40 pounds just a little over 100 years ago. Now, are we better off as a society today? In many ways, yes. You know, we have this advanced technology. We have amazing tech and communications and access. access. But in our health and natural function as a species, that's a big fat no for sure. So let's take a look at how sugar is deeply affecting our society in a number of ways. Let's start with recreational drug use. Okay. All right. In many ways, sugar was considered at a point to be somewhat of a recreational drug. And in many ways today, it is even still used as a drug. And I'll give you some clues as to why this can be put in that category. It changes your physical state. Okay. It changes your mental and emotional state as well. And in the brain, sugar stimulates the feel-good chemical dopamine, all right? Yeah, so yeah. You, you can buy drugs to try to get that same response. That, yeah, yeah. Now, sugar can even induce feelings of euphoria, uh, right? Yeah. Or this, quote, sugar high. Hey. We call it a sugar high. <laughs> That's not an accident. You know, yeah. we definitely have yeah. those, those similarities. Now, sugar becomes glucose in your body, which is the basic building block of energy in your system. Mm-hmm. And so... Lots of it can make you feel incredibly energetic or even hyper, mm-hmm. right? Well, we've seen that in children. <laughs> and I've seen it in grown-ups. In grown-ups, yeah, right? <laughs> for that matter, yeah. But refined sugar will lead to a roller coaster effect on your mood, right? So you, the withdrawals, and you'll feel awesome, but then you'll crash and go into lethargy and depression, and you can even get addicted to sugar as well, right? We, when we use that word addiction, we're usually thinking about drugs, yeah. smoking, mm-hmm. alcohol. Mm-hmm. But you can get just as, if not more, addicted to sugar, and I'm going to tell you why. And, of course, the horrible withdrawals from it. Yeah. So researchers at Princeton University report that repeated sugar consumption will cause a demonstration of all three ca- criteria of addiction. Increased intake, withdrawal, and cravings that lead to relapse. In fact... Researchers are finding that sugar is more addictive than cocaine. Whoa. Now, research compiled by scientists at the University of Bordeaux in France concluded that, quote, overall, researchers reveal that sugar and sweet rewards can not only be a substitute to addictive drugs like cocaine, but can even be more rewarding and attractive. Mm. At the neurological level, the neural substrates of sugar and sweet reward appear to be more robust than those of cocaine i.e. more resistant to functional failures, possibly reflecting past selective evolutionary pressures for seeking and taking foods high in sugar and calories. Now, this really sums it up uh, a lot more right here. And this was a study published by the Public Library of Science in which rats with no prior experience with refined sugar or artificial sweetener were allowed to choose eight times per day between two mutually exclusive levers. One that gave them a dose of cocaine and one that gave them a dose of sugar water. And the results were mind-blowing. Most of the critters studied, and this is a 
stunning 94% of them, oh, more, 94% stop. of the time, became hooked on sugar or saccharin and not cocaine. Wow. In other trials, they found that even rats oh. who were addicted mm. to cocaine quickly switched their preference to sugar once it was offered as a choice. And the rats were willing to do more work for sugar than for cocaine. Now, these researchers speculate that the sweet receptor, and this is, uh, there's two protein receptors located on Le Tang, <laughs> uh, which are, these evolved over ancestral times when the diet was very low in sugar. And this is key. They have not adapted to the high sugar consumption of modern times. And so they're abnormally mm -hmm. stimulated, overstimulated these, recept these receptors and generates this excessive reward signal in the brain as a result. And this is kind of what's happening behind the scenes. And this generally leads to a potential override of normal self-control mechanisms. And thus, the potential for addiction is greatly increased. Now, additionally, their research has found that there's also a cross-tolerance, and I thought this was interesting, a cross-tolerance and cross-dependence between sugars and addictive drugs. And for an example, the animals with a long history of sugar consumption actually became desensitized to the effects of things like morphine, all right? Sugar actually desensitized them to those things. So it makes other drugs not as effective. Crazy. It, it makes morphine ineffective. That's mind-blowing in and of itself. You go to morphine when stuff is off the chain, painful, crazy, bad, difficult, and it can desensitize morphine? Amazing. Yeah. So this is I'm a convinced. this is a big highlight that sugar isn't just affecting your mm -hmm. taste buds and your body fat, but this is a very powerful uh, influence on your nervous system, your neurotransmitter function, your hormones that drives you, it compels you to to consume it, but also it numbs you to the rest of the world. It numbs you to other things. Mm -hmm. Crazy pants. Mm. Now. Let's shift over and talk a little bit about culture in and of itself in regards to sugar. So my question is, how can you villainize sugar, though, besides what you just learned? Well, because of this, say, because of this, not just hear Sean go through that. <laughs> so my real question is, how can you point out the problem with something that signifies love mm. and significance in so many aspects of our lives? How can you villainize the cake that you give to your one-year-old on their very first birthday. So don't hate the, the sugar, hate the game. And, and the love that's involved, the cute pictures yes. that's involved. How could you, we're talking about, it's, this is something that, it's what you give your lover on Valentine's can't Day. can't villainize it because it is so closely tied to it. It signifies your love. It does. I'm giving you some sugar, sugar. <laughs> it's what we give our kids after yeah. their game to celebrate mm -hmm. or to console. It's what we tie into celebrations on nearly every holiday, from Halloween to Christmas to Valentine's Day to Easter. And I still got a little issue with the Easter one because I don't, <laughs> the, that chocolate bunny, that chocolate Doesn't bunny, matter, though. It's chocolate. Um, I had, so there's the, there's the two general kinds. There's the ones that are the hollow ones. Yeah. It's yeah. a little easier to deal with. And then there's the ones that are solid, solid which yeah. is going to take you a solid <laughs> amount of time to try to get through it. But you best believe. Yeah, that I, I did my thing. And also, of course, the Cadbury eggs. Mm. It takes a special kind of person to like that goo inside yeah. of the Cadbury egg. Um, shout out to you. You know who you are. Yeah. And uh, that sugar Explain goo. Explain that to us when you right. get a chance, like, would you? <laughs> I mean, some candy yolk. <laughs> I mean, some candy egg white. It's so weird. <laughs> but, and also the peeps. Oh, All yeah. right, the right. peeps, those marshmallow whatever. I was never really a fan of those, but sometimes, I mean, it messed with it my comes around. sense of humane <laughs> kindness to just pop them like that. <laughs> you know, it's a little chick. You shouldn't just be. You know, oh, my goodness. So the, the peeps. Uh, <laughs> and also, and also, we have to be aware that there's a bunny out there that's laying eggs filled with candy somewhere. All right. So I have no there's idea that. where that whole thing came from, but there, there's a bunny <laughs> on the loose laying eggs. Filled with candy. It has something to so do keep an with eye the out. history of sugar, I bet. So how does that all mm -hmm. tie? To, how can we possibly villainize that? Can't. It's so ingrained in our culture. And uh, I, I remember growing up, you know, obviously, you know, when you're a child, it's just it's part and parcel of this childhood in, in our modernized world that candy is just a thing. Like, it's just a part of your daily. It's, it's a goal. Like, I got to get the candy. <laughs> how, how am I going to do this? And I remember uh, growing up and we lived in, uh, you know, a pretty tough neighborhood but everywhere that we moved to we moved like literally 
I think 13 times. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, I know. Crazy, right? Never. Yeah. Fun fact about right, Sean. Right, right. You think you know that childhood, guy. like, I came from this stable household mm-hmm. until the age of about six, you know, six, seven. And then when I moved in with my mother, we moved around a lot. But mm-hmm. there's always the corner store, mm-hmm. right? The neighborhood corner store. You go there, you know, you get your, uh, you know, your, 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 your deli meats. You get your that kind of stuff, you know, the bread, the milk, and those kind of things. But also, you get your candy, and they the penny candy. Penny all candy, right? baby. One dollar, one hundred pieces. Of That's candy. it. That's it. You become one Richard Branson. Hundred. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, right. I'm just in there. Making it rain. <laughs> I'm just in there like that, you know. And so, uh, you know, and just thinking about the the store owner, I'm picturing him right now. Just how patient he was with these kids coming in, picking a hundred pieces. I'll take five of those. Three of these, you know, the sweetest fish, the sour cherries, yeah. you know, and just going around. And then you get a pe- brown paper bag with these random loose, most of them were loose penny candies mm-hmm. that you just siphon on, yeah. you know, for the next couple of days or sometimes just a day. Yeah. And it's yeah. also it's those shareables, too, right. you know, yeah. like the, that's a friend connector right there, it's you know, sharing option. your candy. Yeah, yeah. So, well, there's, you know, actually, it's kind of funny that you said that. Because there was a whole system of trade and currency going mm. on there, just like you described back with the uh, stock exchange. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. On a small, minute level uh-huh. as well. It is. Now, <laughs> with these examples, I want to really tie in just how much sugar is a part of our lives, mm. our celebrations, and our happy times. So we have to keep that in mind when we're talking about this substance. In the history we just covered, look at where it stands today. Now, There's another big part of our social and happy times that sugar is involved in, and that's entertainment. Hmm. So when you think about going to the movies, right, for most people, they're thinking about the opportunity to get the popcorn and the soda, right? And the soda isn't sugar-free, right? And, of course, the candy. That was when I was a kid and even recently, Mm -hmm. you know, (laughs) not too many years ago. uh, I remember my my wife's first date and I with with me. I'm just getting all like. Right, right. Because I just thought about this. Sugar is bringing up your your I remember memories. Gummy bears. <laughs> I remember I had some gummy bears. Our first date, our date to a movie. We went out before that, but our first date to the movie, and uh, you know, I was trying to share those gummy bears with her. You know, trying to share a little gummy bear. Right. But also, you know, just thinking about all like that display. Right. Mm-hmm. They've got the the milk duds. Mm-hmm. Right. They've got the Twix. They got those random snow caps. Whoppers. The whoppers, though. You're going to bring up the whoppers. I'm, you yeah. took me there. And it's why are these things so vivid? There is a yeah. deep connection yeah. there. I mean, it's almost as if we were there. And honestly, there was a moment there I could smell the popcorn mm. and the environment. It's yeah. just really that connection. You know why? And that. we've talked about this, but, you know, our olfactory senses, mm-hmm. you know, our, our sense of smell uh, is the most powerful connection in our memory. Like it's the, it's the, la- it lasts the longest of all of our senses. And so that part of the brain is what we're looking at. And we've talked about this on past episodes with uh, the, the various experts in, in brain health that we've had on the show, Dr. Daniel Amen, Jim Quick, and understanding that we want to take advantage in a positive way mm-hmm. that part of your brain because mm-hmm. smells are really tied to experiences for us, for sure. Yeah. yeah. And so keep that in mind in that entertain, like that's one of our big things in our culture, like going to the movies mm-hmm. and it's tied in there deeply to that part of our lives. Mm-hmm. So also endorsements, this is important when we're talking about entertainment. And there was a study from New York University that suggests that celebrities mostly plug food and drink products that are low in nutrients and high in sugar and fat. Uh, for some of us, it's going to be, the, yeah, it's no, no big surprise, but have you ever really looked at that and paid attention to that? And, there, and also on the other side of that, there are no endorsements for fruits and vegetables and organic food. Right, the celery guy. If you right, if you think about like, what if Samuel L. Jackson came on like in that credit card commercial? He's like, yeah, eat your fruits and veggies. That's right. That's right. right. What what's if we in could your get crisper? <laughs> if we could get a shift in how we're doing things culturally, mm-hmm. obviously, you know, because of these endorsements from celebrities who you see endorsing things like, you know, Pepsi mm-hmm. or you know McDonald's and mm-hmm. things like that. We've seen historically, mm-hmm. um, or you can get <laughs> maybe like. Uh, Morpheus, right, from from The Matrix, and he's, like, talking to Neo. Free your mind, Neo. What if I were to tell you that eating Brussels sprouts would make you healthy? <laughs> right? And so, <laughs> right, whoa. And then we jump on board with that. 
or Arnold. He's like, what are you doing? <laughs> Eat your asparagus now. <laughs> or Kevin Hart. He's like, listen, kids. <laughs> You got to eat your broccoli. Right, right. And then the kids are like, no, no, <laughs> just eat it. You're going to be healthy. <laughs> so if we can get celebrities to endorse fruits and vegetables, it would change culture. But that's not what we see. Because in real, real talk, this is just if we're being honest with ourselves, it would be hard to turn down a multi-million dollar contract, I'm oh, sure. Yeah. You know, Pepsi's like, you know what? Just need you to uh, you know, take a swig or say that this is good and we, $10 million. It would take a lot to turn that down, mm -hmm. especially if you're not in the business of health, if you're not focused on that. And ironically, you know, uh, Kevin Hart is somebody who is. He's right. actually tied in a lot of health and wellness messages to his platform. And I'm not going to say it's because of the conversation we had, <laughs> but I remember when he was here at That's the studio right. That's right. promoting Ride Along 2 with Ice Cube, and mm -hmm. I was like, Kevin, um, why don't you talk more about, you exactly. know, this fitness why thing when you go on major out? media? Mm -hmm. Right. Because they're out doing this promotion. And then the very next week he was on Conan and he started talking about his his fitness um, challenges and the right. things that he's doing in different. Right. I'm not the saying model, hey, the model saying. health influence is there. Oh, uh, I received that. I received that. And a big shout out to Kevin Hart. Now, Dr. Marie Bragg, who is a psychologist at New York University, carried out a study with colleagues and uh, they said, quote, research has already shown that food advertising leads to overeating. And the food industry spends $1.8 billion a year marketing to youth alone. All right, so it's starting early on, getting you hooked up. To youth alone is yeah. where they'll invest that. Yeah. So you see the consumption goes up. They know it works. They'll pay. Yeah. They'll pay to play. And if we can get a, a lifetime user, you That's know, it. just we're talking about long-term funds here, not mm -hmm. just temporary you know we get get you later on in life right, but if we right. get you from the beginning and you're mm -hmm. a constant consumer that's that's money in the bank for these companies we just referred back to all our childhood memories mm -hmm. so wherever they got us then still resonates today right when you said whoppers i was like right <laughs> malt chocolate cover malt balls i don't even know what a malt ball what is, is but malt uh ball? sign me up now Let's shift gears and talk about music. That's another big part of right. entertainment in our culture. And, of course, there's a connection. There's lots of songs about sugar, right? Mm. There's uh, Sugar Pie Honey Bunch. Yep. I yep. Can't Help Myself, <laughs> right? That was the four tops, right? I Can't Help Myself. Uh -huh. You know that I love you. <laughs> Pour Some Sugar On Me. Pour right? some sugar on me. <laughs> yeah, I'm That's you. Def Leppard, and there's a newer one uh, from Maroon 5, Sugar. It's just called oh, Sugar. Yeah, yeah. Oh, That's the man. jam, Sugar, right? That is the jam. I don't know if you've ever peeped this before, but all of Maroon Five songs are about breaking up. No, there. Except yeah. that one. Except let that me, let me not talk in extremes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Most. Okay. They're okay. upbeat breakup songs. <laughs> all right? Just check it out next time you hear Maroon 5. <laughs> And I was just like, sugar, oh, it's a actually uh and in the video they're getting they're having they're at the wedding, mm -hmm. right? So they're actually going from the other extreme. Oh, yeah. All right. This is just love, it's marriage. Yeah. Right. So uh <laughs> just peep that next time you check out Maroon Five. Mm -hmm. Upbeat breakup songs. Now, uh there's of course there's um, you know, pop culture people like Mandy Moore. Mm -hmm. They're the Archies back in the day. <laughs> Nina Simone has a song mm -hmm. about sugar, mm -hmm. uh, the Rolling Stones, on and on. Lots of sugar related songs, but Outside of that aspect, <laughs> concerts. Concerts are a huge venue for mass consumption of sugar. And in fact, $1.4 billion was spent in 2014 alone on sponsorships with artists, venues, and festivals, which has been steadily rising annually. And with Coca-Cola being one of the largest investors. All right, so... Getting that sugar permeated into that culture mm -hmm. is huge. And I remember uh, taking my wife to the Beyonce concert, hey. right? When, when Queen B was in town, shut this, the city down, <laughs> you know. Really. But um, taking her to that and, you know, it's kind of outside of my paradigm, not re mm -hmm. really in environments like that. And just seeing the lines at the concession stand mm -hmm. were crazy. And I promise you, people were not lined up to buy water. Right. They weren't going to get that, can I get a courtesy cup of water? <laughs> I remember when I first found out that was a thing. Uh -huh. Like, you know, one of my courtesy friends, I think cup. I was like eight years old, out playing, and we went into this place. I didn't have no money. And he got a water. I'm like, how'd you get that? Give me some money. He's like, no, just ask for a courtesy cup. 
right? So I asked, uh, and I was just shocked. I was like, can I have a courtesy cup? I was waiting for them to be like, get out of here, right. shoo. <laughs> and they gave me, you know, a cup of water. But a, as I digress. That was a pivotal, pivotal moment. But think about that. If they'll invest that much money, if yeah. that much money is available for a business to invest mm-hmm. in pure marketing, how much then are they earning in revenue and Crazy. consumption? Crazy Your marketing amounts. budget isn't typically over. It definitely wouldn't be over half of your revenue yeah. or any of your other expenses. So the the uh, the sheer amount of consumption that that triggers. Mm-hmm. And that's just one aspect of their marketing. It's mm-hmm. it's amazing. So, um, and then we move on from there in entertainment, sports. Of course. It's another big part of our entertainment and our culture. Mm-hmm. Athletes themselves in candy. The, um, Dr. Kate Shanahan, who we had on the show, the author of Deep Nutrition, amazing, amazing book. And we'll put that episode in the show notes yeah. as well. Uh, she works with the Los Angeles Lakers and has been, um, you know, uh, running their nutrition programs for many years and I like to think she's responsible for Kobe's last game, <laughs> dropping that uh, 60 points. Good was it 60, show. right? Uh, it was something I think crazy. It was. But, um, you know, <laughs> he, he was supposed to be at that point not capable of, right. of performing like On that. On his downslope. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, um, but she was really governing a lot of those decisions, like with, their, with the team's food. And one of the players that came in a couple years ago was Dwight Howard. And he's since long gone. But mm-hmm. at the time, she stumbled upon something and, you know, because there were, there's different aspects of what sugar can do to you, um, whether it's performance related as far as lethargy. If you're a player, you know, getting that spike and then being very lethargic. And also, if you're making your tissues out of Snickers, <laughs> chances are you can have a harder time recovering if you have an injury or uh, increase your chances of getting injured. Like, what are you actually making your tissues out of? And so she found out about Dwight Howard like this guy because she, you know, she put him on this plan uh to to really up level his nutrition and he was like smuggling he was hiding candy bars <laughs> all over the house he had like uh you know helpers around the house like hiding stashes for him it was crazy i mean he was consuming like That's something serious. along the lines of like 12 candy bars Ooh. a day or something insane mm-hmm. and so mm-hmm. and his body was crying out for it yeah crazy mm-hmm. And really quickly, since we're talking about candy bars, this is a big part of, like, when we talked about the movies, when we talk about going to concerts, the athletics, I'll give you a brief history of the candy bar. So the candy bar had actually began back in 1847. And this is the first chocolate bar was made in Britain by Joseph Fry and his son, who pressed the paste made of cocoa powder and sugar into a bar shape. Now, the chocolate bar was further developed in 1849 when John Cadbury, might sound familiar, (laughs) introduced his brand of a chocolate bar. And in 1875, Henry Nestle realized that adding milk to the chocolate mixture makes it less bitter. Another huge milestone (laughs) in the world of chocolate. And now the first Hershey bar, which is kind of the iconic bar here in the U.S., was produced in 1900. And the can- candy bar genealogy from there goes like this. Clark Bar, 1916. O'Henry, 1920. Reese's Peanut Butter Cups, 1922. Baby Ruth and Milky Way, 1923. Snickers hit the scene in 1930. Three Musketeers, which was one of my jams. <laughs> 1932. Kit Kat, give me a break. In 1933. And Nestle's Crunch in 1938. Mm-hmm. So celebrities have been particularly profitable for delivering our society sugar in the most efficient way to make you fat and sick in the form of beverages, oh, right? Yeah. Promoting and being the the face of these different be- beverages. So we're looking at, uh, I remember commercials for the various Gatorades, mm-hmm. for example, Gatorade, mm-hmm. Powerade, and all the like in that sphere, uh, <laughs> juice, itself you know i remember like an orange juice commercial that had an athlete on it back in the day oh i thought you were talking about oj and his, his no but we're think about the kid about you know yeah and then the one with mean joe green and he was like going down the the yeah. the, the going on to the field and he turned back and he shared his coke with him it's yeah. like whoa i know right right i mean that was a big these iconic moments yeah, yeah now soda with these iconic figures so they create another mm-hmm. association yeah. You know, so we, we've got it connected to our personal special times. Yeah. We connect it to love. We connect it to fun. And then we also connect it to those things we admire and aspire mm, for. Yes. 
it would be really challenging to disconnect or deconstruct that very well woven relationship we have. Exactly. I totally agree. Uh, a big part, obviously, is soda that we didn't mention and seeing all these icons, like you just mentioned, mm -hmm. Mean Joe Green, mm -hmm. and so many people today who are uh, the faces for these brands. And I just want to share this that 20, a 20 ounce bottle of Coke, since we mentioned Coke, that's 65 grams of sugar. Like, what does that right? mean? That's 13 teaspoons. Okay. That's, that's like, watch this. That's one, two, three, four, five. <laughs> I, I'm just going to stop. No, that's no. A lot, that's yeah, a lot of teaspoons. I, like, right there, I was like. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't even halfway there yet. <laughs> right. So a 20-ounce Mountain Dew, oh, do the do. Right. I remember those commercials, mm -hmm. extreme. Yeah. <laughs> uh, 77 grams oh, wow. of sugar. That's about 15.5 teaspoons, so 15 and a half teaspoons. And then, so when uh, the when when the 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 person says say when and the server says <laughs> say when, oh, we're gonna be here for a while. <laughs> so <laughs> we can't talk about the the beverages without talking about Kool Aid. Oh, right? because, don't you do yes, it? Yes, yes, that was yes. <sighs> deeply Kool -Aid didn't come with sugar. Deeply, right? It didn't come with sugar, but boy, did we add it. <laughs> You know who made the best sugar in the house? Grandma. Who, who put the most sugar? You. Who put the most sugar? Was it no, you? I'm not saying it was me. It was you. I was you about of your past. I was a flavor combiner. Okay. Right. I was trying to do the the lemonade with the with the fruit punch. You, you was know, a I was trying to combine. Right. Oh my goodness. But you got to get that sugar right. It's got to yeah. be just sweet enough that it hurts. Yeah. It, it does. <laughs> it's got to kind of have a bit of a burn. A little bite to it. Yeah. That's how sweet. Unregulated it is. beverage. All right. So. Uh, Sunny D was another thing mm -hmm. for me personally. My drink of choice, uh, like especially you know around my teen years, was Hawaiian Punch. Oh yeah, that yeah. was my that That's was my stuff. go to. Right, right. Well, you know the even the um, the dispensers now. You there's not where you can go to the fountain and get the drinks. You have to you can use a digital screen yeah. because there's so many ways they can deliver this sugar yeah. to you now. So where you might have had a choice of six, just in one machine that there's 20 to 25 yeah. various options that you have to key in. You know, I remember, that reminds me of uh, when I was, so I was probably around nine years old, and I would go to the store, go to 7-Eleven for my mom, mm -hmm. pretty much daily, right? For her big. For her double gulp. There was a time, not just the big gulp not or the, the super gulp. big gulp. Right. It came with a double gulp. I think it became illegal. Right, yeah. but I literally had to go in there. You got to put the carton together. Like it gives you like this flat thing. You put the carton together, and I go and get her this Pepsi like every day. Wow, right? And you know, seeing my mother, you know, looking back on it, mm -hmm. and I, I was just in a, a very. This was an environment that was having poor health was contagious in a way. You know, it's just all that we knew. You know, and seeing uh, her carrying so much weight on her frame, and seeing the the illnesses that resulted. From that was just, you know, for me to look back and see that, it's just like, what were we doing? So yeah. unconscious. But at some point, we have to take responsibility. We've got to wake up and realize that these things are going on. These things are controlling us. This isn't just like, oh, I'm, for the nostalgia, mm -hmm. I'm going to get a Coke. Right. But do you have an issue? Right. Right. Is this something that's a, a consistent part of your life? Because if it is, chances are this is killing you. Yeah. This is causing all of these health problems that we're going to talk to in just a moment. But I want to also mention uh, the fact that a lot of sugars and tea drinks, these these different mm -hmm. tea beverages, have just as much, if not Thanks. more, mm -hmm. sugar than soda. Yeah. So please be aware. Please be aware. That's key. Now, coffee. It's another big one. Biggest commodity. Now, the question is, when people are getting coffee, are you getting coffee? That's not the case. Nine mm -hmm. times out of ten is You're the question is, sweeter. would you like some coffee with your <laughs> sugar? Would you like some coffee with that sugar? Uh -huh. Right? We're going it's it's the sweet first. That's what you think you like coffee, but you don't really like that bitter. <laughs> you want that you want that sweetness. And so smoothies, iced coffee, recently the internet was going nuts over this unicorn frappuccino and so just to give you a a, a comparison, 59 grams of sugar there. Mm -mm. And that's about 12 teaspoons of sugar for their 16 ounce grande. The grande size. You're not, you're not gonna so get the baby size, anyways. You're practically a teaspoon per ounce of drink mm. for every ounce. Yeah. Congratulations, you played yourself. <laughs> now, it's What's not the point in liquefying now, it. Just this is the thing. <laughs> That's not even Starbucks' most sugar-filled drink. Uh, stop it. Their basic 
Cafe Vanilla Frappuccino has 69 grams of sugar yes. in a grande size. That's 14 teaspoons. And again, comparison, 16-ounce Slurpee from 7-Eleven has about 36 grams of sugar. All right, mm-hmm. and a twenty-ounce <laughs> bottle of Coke has sixty-five grams, so it's more than that. And you pay a lot more for it too. Yeah, it's, but you're willing to see. You're like you're willing to see. Yeah, you're willing yeah. to see. You'll pay that, won't you? See? <laughs> so <laughs> I really wanted to highlight that and how sugar is so tied into our culture via oh entertainment, via celebrity endorsements, oh and so that we can start to see it when it presents itself now because. For a lot of us, it's just kind of in the back burner. We don't really pay attention to it or we don't think anything of it as far as like somebody, oh, that's cool. Like they got that deal. They got that They got that Coke deal. They got that Pepsi deal. Mm-hmm. They got that Gatorade deal. Well, then it's, so it's only 50 cents. You can get this for 35 cents. It's so inexpensive. It's it's cheaper to get, you often hear, when it comes to the things that are laden with sugar. You yeah. know, you can, matter of fact, you could pay more for an apple, <laughs> Than you could for, of course, you know, definitely. Uh, have you seen the price of avocados? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, you know, the yeah. and it's because of the you know the government subsidies and just the the leverage that these companies have. I mean, they're controlling so many systems that you're you're probably not paying attention to. But I want to shift gears we now and talk about something that again, this is often overlooked, but the relationship between sugar and sex. There's now, there's I see you want to say something already, but there's. <laughs> You know, of course, we mentioned the song, Pour Some Sugar On Me, right? Pour Some Sugar On Me. Oh, <laughs> just reminded me. Uh, salt and pepper. There you go. Chocolate chip, honey dip. Can Chocolate. I get a scoop? Right? <laughs> <laughs> now, real talk, what's the connection here with sexual function? A recent study published in the Journal of Clinical Investigation found that eating too much fructose and glucose can turn off the gene that regulates the levels of active testosterone and estrogen in your body. The production of excess fat forces your liver to turn off sex hormone binding globulin. And this is a gene that produces a protein that estrogen and testosterone need in order to function. So we're literally turning these things off and making it harder for you to be healthy. Yeah, well, right. not so hard or <laughs> I was trying to finesse that one. And so we have to pay more attention to this because we're looking at a, a situation today where erectile dysfunction is just an epidemic, mm-hmm. where um, f- fertility issues are just at all-time highs. And we just did a, a recent episode focusing on natural treatments for fertility and just how to radically in- increase your fertility. Even if you're not trying to have a baby, that fertility is tied to just vitality, mm-hmm. life, right? So you want to be a fertile human being, and you can transmutate that into other areas of your life, not Absolutely. just having babies, but shout <laughs> oh, out to I having know. babies. Hey. All right? So now, oh, time. in a study, right, <laughs> in a study published in the Clinical Endocrinology, we had 74 men of varying ages undergoing an oral glucose tolerance test, and researchers found that sugar induces a significant reduction in total and free testosterone levels. So just consuming directly these sugar treatments drop their testosterone down Mm. right there in black and white. And if we look at uh, an issue, and there are so many issues we could target here, but vaginal dryness, for example, women with dysregulated blood sugar actually have a 33% increased incidence of vaginal dryness. This is something that's often seen with conditions like diabetes and insulin resistance. So these are obviously components that are related to sexual health. Now, reproductive health specifically, deactivation of the sex hormone binding globulin gene is obviously a problem for fertility too. And again, so that episode was 190, by the way, which we'll put in the show notes. And that was how to radically enhance reproductive power. And then we look at what are some of the underlying things related to sugar and reproduction, PCOS, Polycystic ovarian syndrome. Mm. This is the primary cause of female infertility today. And Geraldine Pryor, MD, puts it like this quote, Insulin stimulates androgen receptors on the outside of the ovary, causing the typical PCOS symptoms of excess hair, and this is on the face, arms, and legs, thin hair on the head, and acne. Eventually, this type of diet that's high in sugar will cause obesity, which will cause insulin resistance which is the inability of the cells to take in insulin, which will aggravate the PCOS symptoms even more. 
And androgens also play a role in blocking the release of the egg from the follicle, end quote. Now, obviously, we have this deep connection with sugar that's just been on a parallel track, though, with our rising rates of obesity, of infertility, of insulin resistance, of diabetes, of erectile dysfunction. And all of these conditions are linked to sugar consumption. Mm. Fascinating. Now, it's again, we're not going to say it's the cause, but this correlation with so many different things we need to pay more attention to. Now, I want to touch on sugar and violence, sugar and its relationships to violence. And obviously, we mentioned earlier the connection in, in history with slavery and how sugar played a role in that. But what are other ways that sugar has been capable of, in, of inciting violence? Now, common symptoms of hypoglycemia, so this is when we get a sugar spike and then we crash. Common symptoms of hypoglycemia include weakness, hunger, confusion, irritability, behavioral changes such as aggression, Mm. excitement, and violence, sensory changes such as blurred vision, and something today we have this new term called hangry. Yeah. Right? Hungry and angry. For sure. I got a two, my grandson, I got a grandson, he's two, and we were celebrating his birthday and they put all the cupcakes and all that stuff in him. Nope, it was, it was Easter. And so he had found the eggs and the candy and all the treats. And he was just going and consuming and playing, consuming and playing, consuming and playing. And then he came into the kitchen and he just looked really sleepy and mm. kind of staggering. And in the next moment, he started pounding on my mother-in-law's leg mm. just she told him here give me that you need to eat dinner and he just started hey <laughs> treating her he went thigh. chucky he, he did, went chucky on her did. And, play? right right yeah. and he, and and she says what well, i've never seen him act that way and i yeah. said well i don't know if he's ever consumed that much sugar but it just was like it was total it was complete it was a violent and aggressive response yeah and he seemed like he was not connected to that action at all. It was really frightening to me. And I noticed it, even to recall it now, that it was just so shocking. That's a great example. I mean, and again, because it's such a part of our culture, sugar really does influence our mm. our, our mental function significantly. Mm. And I want to share why. Like, what's one of the underlying mechanisms? Well, the body reacts to low blood glucose. Well, you know, when we get that spike in the crash by the production it reacts with this production of these counter-regulatory hormones like adrenaline. Mm. And these hormones are the fight-or-flight hormones. He was fighting. He was fighting. Or flight. Right. right. He was running from that dinner. <laughs> and that, that's what the body releases yeah. when there is a perceived danger. Mm-hmm. All right? So what are you going to do? You're going to have a, a, a greater propensity towards violence if your, your, your physiology is feeling threatened. Now, Princeton neuroscientist Matthew Botvinnik sees lack of glucose as just one reason among many that we become unglued, what he calls unglued. He says that we should think of hunger not as a lack of fuel, but as an unpleasant state, i.e. the grandkid. He's in an unpleasant state. No different from other such states like having a headache, doing a tedious chore, having to stay late at work, other things that you don't like to do, experiences that tax us and thus make us less willing to devote energy to regulating our moods and responses. Mm, Spend less energy in regulating our mood and responses. Yes. So even exercising some sort of control or moderation. Wow. Now, check this out. So this was a study that was done by uh, Ohio State University, and this one is pretty bananas. Uh, They were aware that there are multiple studies suggesting that low blood sugar from uh, this crash, from going hypoglycemic, is an underlying cause of hunger-induced crankiness. And so they sought to find out just how much, like, what can can go wrong here? What's going on behind the scenes? And so they recruited 107 couples for the study, and they assessed the quality of their relationships and taught them how to measure their blood sugar. And then, this is the crazy part, they gave each of the volunteers in the couple a voodoo doll with 51 pins. And they told the participants that this doll represents their spouse and that every night before they went to bed, they should stab the doll with pins, depending on how angry they are with their spouse. 
Now, so the more pins they put in the Dow, the angrier they were. Now, after three weeks, and this is crazy, the team assessed the damage that was done to each Dow's, and volunteers who had low blood levels below normal from going hypoglycemic stuck more pins into the voodoo dials than those who had normal <laughs> levels of blood glucose. And his team reported this. This was in the uh, proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. And so even in that context of your most intimate relationships, there's going to be a tendency towards an attitude change. Mm-hmm. And there's this is a weird kind of violence, like you're stabbing a, a, a voodoo dial with some pins. Right. Kind of weird, but just a really interesting assessment there. So that makes me want to go back to your movie date with the gummy bears. So later (laughs) on that day, (laughs) everything worked out. I was eating pretty healthy there too. You know, it's still some some violence. You know, I'm probably not. I'm not interested in gummy bears today. (laughs) All right, but I I was pretty good there. Uh Now things work out with your your relationship that evening. I After can't tell the that. details. Oh, I mean, oh, well, we can't kiss. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> Let's back up. <laughs> out of that one. Let's back up. Let's back up. <laughs> we'll just go back All to right. Whoppers. <laughs> All right. Now, researchers from Cardiff University in the UK found that higher rates of sugar consumption as children can lead to higher rates of violence as, re- as adults. What they discovered was that this was related to functions of difficulty in delayed gratification because sugar is so strong and addictive. Also, a higher propensity towards impulsiveness. And this doesn't account for all the factors that they found in the study, but it's definitely an interesting one to take notice of. And so this is what they did. They studied 7,000 people born in 1970 who were part of this British cohort study. And they found that by age 34, 38 of the participants, 90% of them male, had committed at least one violent offense. Mm. And of the participants whose data was analyzed, 69% of them ate confectionery, quote, confectionery, which covers candy and anything sugary, daily during childhood, whereas 42% of the nonviolent people indulged daily. All right, so just understand there's, again, this is a unique correlation. It's not causation. We're not taking into account other factors, but we're looking at... 27% 27% increase in probability of a violent offense when you consume candy on a regular basis or, con- quote, confectionery. Mm-hmm. That's really fascinating stuff. Now, one more subject I want to touch on before we get to the health implications and kind of wrap this up is the big business of sugar itself. So this is understanding, if we look back again at history, it was very, very expensive in the beginning. And a teaspoon of sugar in the 16th century costed the equivalent of $5 all right, in London. In 1319, a kilo of sugar, again, known as white gold. And again, how much sugar do we consume today? Much. Right? It's changed so much because it's so cheap. Mm-hmm. And the average person, and this is the, in the industrialized countries, consumes, and this is across the board, industrialized co- countries, 53 pounds of sugar each year. And again, 150 pounds of added sugars a year here in the U.S. per person. And I came across this ad back in the day. This was actually a magazine ad promoting the use of sugar. So this is like around the 40s and 50s. And it says the big headline is sugar's quick energy can be the willpower you need to eat less. Mm. (laughs) This was legal to market that. And today we see the the global sugar slash sweetener market is projected to reach almost $100 billion this year, according to BCC research. Dr. Eve, Q Dr. Evil, $100 billion. Yes. CNH, it's a quick shout out because this is the sugar that I remember most mm-hmm. frequently. CNH, mm-hmm. that's ca- the California and Hawaiian Sugar Company. That was founded in 1906 produces about 640,000 metric tons of sugar per year that is processed. And the American Sugar Refinery Company, and this this was actually the company on the Dow Jones, Mm -hmm. right, was the parent company of Domino Sugar, which is established in 1900. Mm -hmm. And in 1916, Domino introduced individually wrapped sugar tablets, by the way. So they were actually in tablet form instead of the granulated, kind of like little packets of butter in a way. And this is a big, big business. We have to keep this in mind. So I just gave you a quick little brief history of the major sugar companies. We have to keep in mind $100 billion. Yeah. 
All right. One hundred billion dollars. Mm-hmm. And Big how business, how would these companies feel if people start consuming less sugar? That's, that's their money. That's going to cut into their bottom line. So yes. guess what? They're going to find every way they can to manipulate and to get sugar into products and get them into your body. Mm-hmm. And so we'll probably ramp it up. Yes. Mm-hmm. We have to be mm-hmm. aware that some things get worse before they get better. We need to be aware as you start to pull back and become more aware that these companies are fighting very hard to keep building their bottom line. Now, diseases that are linked to sugar consumption. We need to discuss this. The first one that generally comes to mind is diabetes Mm -hmm. slash the sugar. sugar. I remember (laughs) some adults when I was a kid calling it the sugar. It's got the sugar. I got the sugar. I got to watch. Watch the sugar. So how does this work? Well, essentially, and this is, again, we've done an entire episode Mm -hmm. dedicated to breaking down, reverse engineering this illness, and uh, we'll put that in the show notes. That's the diabetes episode, correct? Yeah, the diabetes Mm -hmm. episode. We we did another episode as well detailing uh, some natural solutions for this. And so we'll put that in the show notes. And so this is the 100-foot view of how this is functioning in our body. Basically, your beta cells in your pancreas are producing insulin, and this is in response to glucose showing up in your blood. So glucose is this form of energy currency in the body, but it cannot sit around and be prevalent in your bloodstream because it's dangerous. It can start to break things apart if it's too prevalent in your blood. So insulin comes along to grab that molecule, move it into your cells. Now, diabetes comes about when there's an insulin resistance. So much sugar, and we're talking about type 2 diabetes, on this adult onset diabetes, which is no longer exclusively for adults, by the way, This is a situation where there's so much sugar exposure in the body that with all of the glucose that's in the blood, the cells begin begin to become resistant to allowing that much sugar to be put into your cells. And so insulin itself starts to like, my job is too hard. Right. I did. You got so much sugar coming in here. (laughs) You're working me to the bone, work my fingers to the bone. I'm not coming in today. All right. No call, no show. And so that's a 50 foot wow, view. Like this that. is, there's, Finally. again, we broke it down mm-hmm. in depth. And I think I even gave an analogy of insulin being like the, uh, the club bouncer. Right, right. You know, right. so definitely check out that episode if you want to get more details on how that illness works. But the mm-hmm. bottom line is this diabetes is a very, very dangerous illness that's tied to many other illnesses. With, with diabetes, people often pass away or uh, put themselves in a very, very tough state from other illnesses. So this is another catalyst for heart disease, heart attacks, cancer, um, amputation, right? Losing vision. So many different things spring from this insulin resistance and diabetes. So uh, I want you to be aware of that. And the cause, these processed foods, sugar. That's really behind the scenes what's what's causing a lot of the issues related to type 2 diabetes. Now we move on to the second most connected thing mentally for us when it comes to sugar is obesity and glucose and fructose are metabolized in the liver so that's important to understand but fructose is 100 percent metabolized by the liver which we'll talk about just in just a moment but when there's too much sugar in the diet the liver converts it into a lipid you know it's a process called lipogenesis your liver is trying to protect you and not allow all of that to be in circulation in your body so it converts it into lipids and this is how basically uh, a slice of cake ends up as body fat, all right? Your body isn't just, it's not just fat in and of itself. It's a process of conversion that happens via your liver who's handling this sugar. So we have to take care of our liver, and we did an entire episode dedicated to that too. That was a great one. We'll put that in the show notes. Love your liver. Powerful fat burning is like it's heavily related to fat burning processes in your body, which we'll learn about in that episode. So this increase in lipids is what shuts down that gene that we talked about that regulates the level of sex hormones. Huh? See the connection. So excess sugar can create leptin resistance as well. And so leptin is your body's satiety hormone. And basically your fat cells are still producing leptin. We have to keep that in mind. But your leptin receptors downregulate because they are too bombarded. And there's one study in the journal Clinical Endocrinology that looked at three groups of men and found that those with higher leptin levels, most likely due to leptin resistance, also had significantly higher body mass index and lower levels of testosterone. All right, so we can do a whole show just talking about sugar and obesity in and of itself, but just please understand, this is the contributing factor. It's not 
um, farm farm raised eggs. This is it's sugar, right? It's not fruits and vegetables that we talked about earlier. Or let me be clear: natural, lower sugar fruits, not <laughs> not uh, genetically modified bananas. Mm-hmm. All right, if you're going bananas on bananas, that can show up again because your body doesn't really care what type of sugar it is, it's going to end up as glucose in your in your blood or fructose in your liver. And your body has to do work, massive processes to keep you safe. And if that means turning that into fat and storing it on your That's on your booty or on your belly, mm-hmm. then your belly. I saw you I saw you shift your butt up a little <laughs> Every bit. Every time I hear the word. <laughs> you got it's, an, <laughs> it's a it's a natural response. It's an alarm for you. Oh That's my right. goodness. You're trouble. <laughs> All right. Now, so I just want people to 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 Recognize that to really look at that, that this obesity epidemic, when we're talking about obesity, when we're talking about diabetes, these two conditions, the driving force here is our society's obsession with sugar. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, we could talk about heart disease uh, really quickly, consumed in excess. When we talk about the process with the liver, uh, the lipogenesis, it also creates uh, higher rates of these triglycerides and also low-density lipoprotein molecules as well, that these are the more dangerous forms of cholesterol, and this is generated from overconsumption of carbohydrate, not from eating cholesterol, all right, which is an important nutrient, actually, for building your sex hormones. You need cholesterol, but the, quote, bad kind of cholesterol, the very low-dense lipoprotein molecules, is a result of overconsumption of carbohydrate. So there's connections to cancer, Alzheimer's and dementia, macular degeneration, sleep disturbances, bone degeneration, skin disorders, uh, chronic fatigue, dental issues. Obviously, that's another thing people recognize. Arthritis, inflammation, and gut dysbiosis. And so this is just some of the list. We just have to be aware today to recognize the history of sugar has led us to this point, and it's not a normal thing. This is something we did not evolve with. And we can mutate, mute, but... You have to be aware evolution Sugar takes time. Sugar mutate too. <laughs> right. Evolution takes time. Tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of years. And I don't think you got that kind of time. Nah. We maybe can hit the X-Men button. I don't know <laughs> if sugar's going to be the trigger here. Are you going to be an inhuman or whatever and, you know, get some power. Maybe you shoot out sugar at people. <laughs> sugar man. I'm sugar man. Sugar man is sweet. <laughs> oh, uh, so that's me. probably not going to happen. Now. <laughs> What alternatives do we have? Well, one of the big ones today is, and there's some positive here, there's some not so positive, high fructose corn syrup I want to talk about really quickly. And your body metabolizes fructose in a much different way than glucose. And fructose is broken down specifically by your liver, just like alcohol, and produces many of the same side effects of alcohol, mm. right down to the, quote, beer belly. <laughs> and Princeton researchers found that high fructose corn syrup prompts considerably more weight gain than table sugar. Please be aware. And high fructose corn syrup is also linked to high rates of diabetes and heart disease included. And high fructose corn syrup, many people are aware of this today. But I remember, that, again, they had that last-ditch effort. They had a commercial where there were people sitting there, like, at, the, at a picnic, and they're, like, eating popsicles. And the, one mom was like, why won't you eat that or give that to your kid? Oh, it has high fructose corn syrup. And then the person responds like, so what's wrong with that? And the person's like, well, I don't know. Mm-hmm. And then it cuts to the music. It's just like it's so ignorant, mm-hmm. so ignorant. And that would just the if you're in zombie mode, you're just going to be like, of course. Yeah. Right. But if you're aware and you can look at the, some of the data, just a little bit of the data, you know what the problem is. Now, there were two studies that were done using med students, and both were looking at the biological responses to fructose. And in the first study, the students were given either a large glucose load or a large fructose load. And the students given fructose almost 30% of the calories ended up as fat. And in the students given glucose, almost none ended up as fat. Mm. All right. Now, again, 20% of the glucose is metabolized by the liver, but this is related to the fact that nearly every cell in your body can directly use glucose as a fuel source. So it's kind of burned up immediately in a way. But I don't, it depends I'll on how much you take in. Granted, yeah. It takes out. It, it depends on how much you take in. Got so it. we got to be clear on that. So fructose is very dangerous in its response because that accumulation of of extra fat, it can definitely be a problem because that fat begins to function as another endocrine organ mm-hmm. that's not doing friendly things for you. Maybe a more positive upgrade. We can look at 
uh, substance like stevia. Yeah. You know, this is very popular. Now, there are some potential issues with stevia, just like any of this stuff, but we want to look at what's the root of it. The best form of that is going to be the whole leaf itself, right? Which it has a little, like it's a sweet, very sweet leaf, but it has this weird kind of medicinal aftertaste, mm -hmm. you know? So it's, it depends on how you use it. But then we can get all the way to the concentrated version that looks like sugar. And maybe that's not cool because it's so far removed from where it came from. Now, still, you can use so much less of this. This is why I'm a big fan of it. You can use the whole leaf or use, and I, I like the little uh, drops, mm -hmm, like the too. stevia drops. You could use like three and it's sweetened yeah, great, yeah, yeah. right? It's yeah. just a small amount as compared to, you know, two or three teaspoons of sugar you'd want to try to get that same kind of vibe. And another popular choice today is something called monk fruit, or lo hang go is the name. And monk fruit has been used for centuries in traditional Chinese medicine, but only recently the FDA approved it for use as a sweetener, and that was in 2010. Now, monk fruit contains natural sugars like fructose and glucose, but in smaller amounts. And it's actually not sweet because of those. This is what's so different about this than other foods. Monk fruit extract actually gets its intense sweetness from a unique antioxidant called mogrosides. Mogrosides, right? So it's actually getting its sweetness from an antioxidant, which is pretty interesting. And obviously there's, there's honey, which is more of considered of a, of a whole food in a way. Mm -hmm. uh, so you want to get, if you are using honey, that's not pasteurized. It's just raw honey, preferably local honey. And you can look at some research showing that there's some positive benefits for things like allergies. There's obviously big tradition with uh, you know, treating burns and things like that. But it has an abundance of minerals, trace minerals. It's enzymatically active, antioxidant rich. But you want to use this in small amounts as well because, it's, again, it's a pretty strong sweetener. Agave, I have to mention this one. This is very important for this history lesson. It's considered to be a, quote, natural sweetener. But something that's high in fructose can naturally kill you. <laughs> and blue agave, this is an, it's an exotic plant that's growing in rich volcanic soil of Mexico under the hot tropical sun, boasting a stately flower that blooms only once in its lifetime. Look at that. It's romantic, right? Yes, it is. So we're setting it up. And if you ferment it, it becomes Mexico's favorite adult beverage and also uh, a couple of my uncles, tequila. Hey, well, right? I so, like it already. Now, here's the, here's the <laughs> issue. Fructose does, and this is why it was so promoted, and I, I was one of those people. I went with it. Mm -hmm. It doesn't raise blood sugar mm -hmm. in the same way that sugar does. It's negligible or insulin in the short term, but when consumed in high amounts, it leads to insulin resistance. And the long-term effects of chronically elevated blood sugar and insulin levels, you'll see those flood in with long-term use. Now, depending on the source and processing method, agave syrup can contain as little as, and this is very rare that you'll see this, as little as 55% 50, fructose. That's the same amount found in high fructose corn syrup. Now, most as agave little, syrup. So why would we call that little? Okay, that's the small amount. Okay. I said as little. Okay. Most agave products, most agave syrups. Oh wow. Have higher fructose co content than any commercial sweetener, ranging up to ninety-seven percent fructose. Good grief. Far more fructose than high fructose corn syrup. It's called high fructose corn syrup mm -hmm. because it's high fructose. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. I, personally, when I began using it early on, you know. Uh, trusted advisor said, you know, this is a new great thing. It doesn't raise, but I didn't look at the research. And so when I would use it, I would even use it in classes every single time I get a headache, every time. But I was just like, ignore, I like push it off as something else. Like I must be this, I must be stressed or whatever. I right. give it some other reason. But whenever I didn't have the agave, I didn't have a headache. And this is reported by Dr. Ingrid Kolstad. And this is a fellow of the American College of Nutrition and an associate faculty member at John Hopkins School of Public Health says that Quote, agave is almost all fructose, a highly processed sugar with great marketing, end quote. With great marketing. So just be aware. I know that this might push some buttons for you. It's like, you know, I'm a big, agave has been great for me. If, regardless, if it's something you were using, you're using less, and you were doing all these other great things with your food choices, you're probably going to get a lot healthier. Mm -hmm. It's still an option, but I wouldn't advocate the use of it. You just need to be much, much more aware. There's raw sugar. This quote, raw sugar, uh, turbinado, and this is a less processed form of sugar, but please understand it's still 
sugar. And it's still a very high concentrated uh, source of all the things that we've talked about earlier. So these are some various options when we're looking at alternatives to sugar. But there's a better way, even outside of the things we're trying to substitute, you know, even fruits, you know, it's a great substitute as well. You know, if you're making smoothies and things like that, you don't got to go and pour like the the Frappuccino that we talked about earlier, all that sugar in, into the beverage, you can utilize some fruits that have fiber, that have these sweet notes as well, and all the, the vitamins and minerals. It's, you know, more real food-based things. But the real question is, where we are in our history, how do we break up with sugar? Right. You know, it's like, sugar, you've been there for me. We've grown together, but I think we need to see other people. I think we've grown apart. You're way right? too good at that. You're, you're, no, <laughs> no, no. You know, I, we had our time. And at this point, there's a lot of negative repercussions that are happening in my life. And I want to be free. So how do we break up with sugar? And how we do that, number one, this is awareness is the first step. Awareness trumps everything. And today's show is important in that. And note to yourself, the foods that tend to have a little bit more seductive grasp on you, right? Become aware of these things, these sugar-laden foods that tend to have that that, that control over you. So awareness trumps everything, and that's what today's show is all about. Another key here is to reset your palate. Real food with the use of wonderful culinary spices can fulfill the deepest desires for taste sensations, variety, and overall pleasure from food. I definitely had my palate set to sugar on 100, like all the time. And today I can find sweetness in even bitter foods, you know, because my palate has changed and evolved. And it's, I guess it's just more normal at this point. And with that said, you can actually enjoy, like I'm so much more appreciative of food because I can taste all of these different sensations and I'm not just getting hammered by this sweet the sweet experience that makes other things just not as fulfilling. Mm -hmm. So like you said, it numbs the other, it can numb the other sensation. So what we want to do is we want to put some respect (laughs) on your (laughs) flavor receptors. All right. Not respect, respect, Respect. put some respect on your flavor receptors. (laughs) So our gustatory system. um, So we want to look at sweet, right? Sweet, salty, sour, bitter, These are all flavor sensations that we want to consciously incorporate in our lives on a frequent basis, if not daily. And another one is the uh, umami or savory, right? This is becoming uh, something that's being more considered uh, part of this gustatory system. And people that taste umami through taste receptors, specifically glutamate, and glutamate is widely present in savory foods such as meat, broths, fermented products, and... The issue, though, is that food manufacturers take advantage of this sensation. And you heard glutamate. You might have heard of something called monosodium glutamate Mm -hmm. in their products. So to get you instead of the sweet or we hit you with the sweet and that, forget Forget about about it. it. Right. And so these are MSG is known as an an excitotoxin or something that uh, stimulates your cells, your brain cells to the point that they actually die, uh, causing headaches, insomnia, obesity, depression. There's studies linking all of that. And you just go to Dr. Google and you can look that up now. Foods that are rich in this flavor sensation are notably fish, shellfish, mushrooms, veggies, and things like that. And in humans, we first encounter the umami component in breast milk. And it it contains roughly the same amount of umami as broth. Right. I hear you. I hear you. (laughs) And as a bonus, spicy. That's another. It's not really considered to be something that is a a flavor, but more of an experience, but I consider it as a flavor, all right? So you want to enjoy that, like imbue these different flavor sensations and experiences into your palate. Try to do that on a daily basis. Also, cool is one other one that we often don't think about, like that minty experience as well. So another key here is to upgrade the ingredients of your sweets. This is something we're big proponents of. We're definitely not the anti-fun people, You know, and I think that that's what's most healing is being able to enjoy your food and enjoy the process of getting well and living this life. Like we we have to eat. We might as well like it, (laughs) you know. And so uh, upgrade the ingredients of your sweet. And so what that would look like is our 
good friend, Michael Morelli. You know, he does the uh, the carb cycling and the sweet potato diet. It was on recently talking about that. And he mentioned the fact that he has this sweet potato brownies recipe in his book and the sweet potato muffins, which I just had yesterday. Mm-hmm. Shout out to Michael Morelli. We'll put that episode in the show notes for you as well. But we're upgrading the ingredients, right? Instead of using this uh, terrible enriched bleached flour, you know, maybe using coconut flour, right? Or even you can go with a gluten-free option, but understand that's that's going to be something that is uh, towards spiking insulin as well. But higher quality options, and then we look at the sweetness from sweet potato, right? Maybe there's a little added honey in the mix or something like that. But more real food base, more whole ingredients going into your favorite uh, indulgences. Another example is protein pancakes. You know, I'm a big fan of these. So we'll use the hemp force protein from on it in the mix and ground flaxseed. I'll throw that in there. Some You can use some gluten-free mix or make your own from like lower glycemic blends like coconut flour, almond flour, and things like that. Uh, the eggs, unsweetened almond milk as well, and whip up some pretty tasty pancakes too. And lastly, you want to ensure that your body is not deficient. That sweet desire, it's a driver for more calories to fulfill needs, just to fulfill temporary energy needs for survival. But if you are rich within yourself, Mm -hmm. as far as the nutrients, the vitamins, the minerals, the amino acids, all these amazing compounds, you're going to be far less likely to fall off the wagons, so to speak, (laughs) and go crazy on some donuts and some Mm -hmm. soda and, Mm -hmm. you know, these sugar laced things, this unicorn frappuccino. (laughs) Right, a really sovereign, healthy person is probably not going to be attracted not to that. Even attracted, yes. but sometimes, again, there there are me. ways yeah. to enjoy some of these things. But we just want to be in control to make the choice, and not it controlling us. So That's right. make sure you're getting your greens in. This is very important. And for us, we use the green. And you saw my bottle here. Yes, the green superfood blend from Organifi. Mm-hmm. And so Organifi has spirulina, moringa, chlorella, Sp- spirulina. 71% protein by weight, all right? Powerhouse source of protein, gram for gram, the number one protein food in the world, plus phycocyanin for stem cell genesis, literally creating new stem cells. Chlorella, chlorella growth factors in there, powerful for uh, eliminating heavy metals from your body. The moringa, one of the most nutrient-dense foods in the world, plus it has ashwagandha, coconut water, and make it taste water, sweet. Yes. There's a little mint in there. So it's using these different... Uh, taste sensations to make this taste good. That's the key, though. It actually tastes good. When you have Company X uh, green powder, there's so many different green powders out there, and I've tried so many. Oh, my goodness. If you only knew, this one actually tastes amazing, and you can drink it straight. You know, my kids actually would drink it straight, or you add it to smoothies, things like that. So make sure that you are using a green superfood blend like the one from Organifi. So head over to O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I.com forward slash model and you're going to get 20% off the Organifi Green Juice and all of their other amazing products as well. And I've got to get Jade one of my yes. fancy Organifi our. glass bottles. Yes, yes. Our, our. Our Organifi glass bottles. <laughs> the last thing I want to share with you is the mental component here, the emotional connection, you know, the deeper meaning of sweetness. So are we, in fact, looking for more sweetness externally because we're lacking sweetness in our life mm. in a way, you know? And this is something that we strive towards, you know, when life is sweet. We want to find that in other places outside of just food. Again, food is an important factor, but what about our relationships? But what about our exercise? What about our uh, getting out and enjoying life and this amazing body that we have and exploring, right? This vast, amazing world. You could, If you explored every day of your life, you would not be able to explore even 5% of this planet, you know? So it's so much for us to do and to make life far more sweeter so that we're not so driven Mm -hmm. to grab sweetness from a piece of candy. For that sweet satisfaction. Now, we have to understand that food and and sugar does have a very strong emotional connection for us, and we talked about that today and how it relates to our most prized events and our most exciting holidays in our society. You know, grandma, grandma, right? Grandma, even her kisses, I remember my great-grandmother, she was like, give me some sugar. Mm -hmm. Give me some sugar, baby. You know, and so this is tied to those feelings of love and and warmth and inclusiveness and uh, something that 
it can get to a point where it gets twisted, though, because if we've moved away from those situations and now we're isolated, now we're working our ourselves, you know, right into an early into an early grave and we're stressed out and we're not connecting with our loved ones, we're going to have that psychological connection to love and sugar, right? It's there. It's tied in there. You know, when I felt loved, when I felt connected, I was I was getting uh, the, the intimates from my grandma. Sure, sure. Right? And then when you don't feel loved and you don't feel connected, you'll grab the intimates to yeah. fill that void. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But that was actually only for the guests when the guests come uh, over. <laughs> yeah, well, we couldn't need it just because. <laughs> believe me, when I got off on my own and I was in college and I had those feelings of absence and, and, and loneliness yeah. or missing, I'd go to the store and I'd get the box mm-hmm. and it'd be me by myself. Exactly. Carrying that same behavior pattern. Yeah. Freshman. Shout out to Freshman 15. Yeah, doggone it. (laughs) So please understand we've got to acknowledge that aspect as well. And really, uh, this today, this episode was really an important process of taking you through the history of sugar and looking at all the different aspects and how it ties into our culture as a whole so that we can become more empowered in our relationship to this remarkable substance that's really had an impact on our culture. And at the same time, there's plenty of happy times and, and potential uh, benefit there in, in in some instances. But the downside is tremendous when things have gotten out of hand to the degree that they have today. And today is about taking control and waking up to this process, being aware of how this whole thing started, where we are today, and where we're moving towards in the future. And If you've got a lot of value out of this episode, please make sure to share this with your friends and family on social media, on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, everywhere that you can get the word out and and share, give that gift of empowerment and awareness. And it's such an important time because today, more than any other time in history, we have the ability to share this with our loved ones and for all of us to collectively make a stand and to take back control of our health. I appreciate you so much. Have an amazing day. And I'll talk with you soon.